Hey, this is Kevin Van Trump here with Andy Daniels. We're doing another edition of our highly volatile podcast. Andy and I had uh, quite a few requests to try and do at least one or two a month uh, into this new year. So Andy and I are trying to make a little bit of a commitment. We got our good friend Carter Williams, uh, CEO of iSelect on the call today. Uh, we're doing a Zoom call. And like I said, we kind of went to the wire here, Andy. We went, uh, <laughs> we thought we'd get one or two done and we're going right to the end of February. We're trying to squeeze one in here. So uh, we're sticking to our commitment. Andy's got a nice tan down there in Florida and he's been down in Naples. I was in Florida for a little while. I uh, went down and spoke for uh, uh, some folks down in Florida and met with Dowd and a few of the other guys from Main Point and uh, some other good good folks uh, in the commodity space. So here we are now with uh, Carter and Andy. Welcome, you guys. Thanks for being here. Yeah, good to see you. I haven't seen you since uh, FarmCon. Yeah, since FarmCon it is. So FarmCon it is. You know it. I got a new I was just telling Andy. I got a haircut for you. Yeah, you look good, man. Where are you at? You in St. Louis or Michigan? I am in St. Louis. St. Louis, yeah. Andy, you're down in Naples. I'm down in Naples. That's right. Right on. Buddy. The warm, warm weather and uh, not not uh, missing all the uh, big polar vortex is moving through the uh, upper Midwest. Yeah, it's Boy, supposed to get cold here. Nine hundred yeah, flights canceled already today. Wait, I think that's north of us, but Ripley is inside today because it's raining, so Ripley can't go out and play. <laughs> Uh, a dog's life. A dog's life. That's true. I told you guys we got COVID in the house. Michelle's got COVID. I don't have it yet, so we'll see what happens. Who knows? Shit. So, is there an over time? No, no over under. A hey, nice Chiefs win, by the way, right, Daddy? Chiefs. Oh, how about it? Yeah, that's a hell of a win. It's good. Yeah, Neither one of us went to the game, but bet a little bit. That was good. So, Carter, did you go or anything? No, watching on. TV? I watched. I did not yeah. go. I watched. Yeah. Would you go? No, nah, we didn't go. I didn't want to fight it. The kids wanted to, but I wasn't going to spend that money and buy those tickets. So, you know, they can go on their own. <laughs> Same with you, Andy. <laughs> those tickets yeah, were so cool. Yeah, well, you had the, uh, the the waste management golf outing going on at the same time. So it, it, had, it was quite uh, congested in the city of Phoenix to host both yeah. of those events. Yeah. My my private jet was broken that day. I couldn't get out there. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you, buddy. Yeah, uh, no. Even if you had uh, your private jet available, it might not have been able to land. The uh, wouldn't have been able to fit. All the uh, uh, yeah, all the FBOs were quite full apparently. So life is good in the uh, upper echelon of uh, sports um, sports folks. <clears throat> Yeah, let's talk about the let's talk about the markets real quick. I guess everyone's probably you know paying attention here, trying to figure out what they're going to do with their corn, beans, and wheat. And Andy and I maybe a couple of quick comments. I got sold out of beans uh, when we pushed up above fifteen forty, fifteen fifty, right in there with meal up above five hundred bucks. It just seems like the air gets awful thin on the demand side of the things. I don't know if that's going to be the case with the Argentine situation. Uh, you know, Argentine crop continues to get smaller, I, you know, that's going to obviously put some pressure on, you know, uh, global supply. I think Argentina is what, Andy, 40% of global exports or somewhere right around there, 38, 40%. So probably going to push some things, make some things a little bit tight, obviously on the uh, bean balance sheet. Corn, I still got about 10% of old crop left, probably should be selling some on any rally. Same with uh, new crop. I'd like to price a little bit more new crop if we get back up here closer to, uh, Past that six, you know, six twenty range, somewhere in that area. Same with beans. So, and I got sixty percent of new crop wheat sold. And I made the first sale on uh, twenty twenty four wheat when we were up above eight bucks and eight uh, eight forty in in hard red winter. So, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Andy, what are you seeing on the corn bean wheat thing? Any trading it? Trade it? Well, I think uh, beans. I, I I would agree with you. I I I'm, I'm, I am concerned about Argentina. I, I think that's maybe down the road. I mean, everything happens in sequence. Brazil harvests first, and that harvest will uh, keep pressure, I think, on the markets uh, to a degree. We're getting rain down there now, so I don't know if that's going to push a few boats back to the U.S. or not. As a result, I'm not doing anything in the bean spreads at the moment, um, but uh, barge freight continues to crater, and and uh, I, I think that you know, Argentina could be meaningful, you know, what we lose there. I mean, there are people down there talking sub 30 million ton. I mean, you goofy numbers as low as a 25 million ton crop. I, mean, I don't believe it, 
but uh, you know, never say never. And last year I wasn't a believer when we were talking 40 and we ended up uh, significantly less. So anything's possible. Um, the fact that we're actually exporting beans from Brazil to Argentina right now uh, speaks volumes about uh, soy meal. And um, while we're getting a correction in that because oil was so grossly oversold, uh, and so that the price relationship between meal and oil is kind of coming back in favor of, you know, meal was gaining dramatically on oil and now we're kind of reversing that role here for a minute. But I think that uh, meal is going to stay tight. And um, uh, I, I always feel better about a bean led, a meal led bean led rally than I do an oil led bean led rally, if that makes sense. So um, as far as corn goes, you know, I, I think China is mad at us and I think they're going to stay mad at us. And I'm not really feeling the love that they're going to be here to uh, support our export markets. We're the market of last resort, not first resort for them. And um, as a result, I, I am having a hard time getting uh, on the long side of corn. I think uh, we have some way to go before we know what South America's corn crops can be. Certainly the Safrina crop is uh, just now getting planted. And, um, but, you know, I, I don't think, uh, I'm not that optimistic about our export outlook in, in that regard. So I'm a little bit negative on corn. I'm nervous about beans with, with Argentina and the problems they're having and uh, wheat. You know, I think that we're having more and more concerns every day about uh, how this whole issue is gonna work out with Ukraine. Um, you never know uh, all the unknowns and uncertainties out there. I wouldn't be short wheat, not, not with stolen money at the moment, but um, to be long fundamentally, no, but to not be short because of the uncertainty of what you know Russia could do or what this could escalate into, uh, it makes me nervous. So I'm kind of friendly in that regard. Carter, you're kind of our uh, resident military Talker, what uh, what are you hearing on the Ukraine Russian side of things? You hearing anything? I uh, I guess I was hearing that that the Ukrainians are running us out of howitzer shells, and so somebody was concerned that you know maybe U.S. production isn't up to it. And my reaction was maybe they need to aim better. You, you go through a lot more shells if you don't know how to aim, and. Uh, the thing I've heard a little bit about this China thing of China supplying Russia is maybe that conversation is China saying, look, if you negotiate a settlement, we'll help resupply you, and, but get out of the battle. Um, so that's a little interesting. Um, but I I am still confused about a lot of people shooting at each other over there, and at some point the Ukrainians need to get their training up and they're getting these new systems and it takes a lot of time to learn these new systems. So I'm a little confused about what's going on with that. And then why are we saying we're going to send tanks and we don't send tanks? So I, I think there's some other thing going on in various geopolitical negotiations that I can't, I can't figure out, but everything that's on the news. What do you think? What, what's the longer term? What do you think the longer term play is by Russia here? Just to get a few areas and, shut it down or, or what, what are we doing uh, it is beyond me um i think that the the real long-term play is i'm more paying attention to china and china's long-term play is open up the trans-siberian route to get grain and food out of europe and to make europe part of their bread basket and further detached from the u.s and so to some degree, I'm more, I've been paying more attention to China's moves. And I think that Russia is just China's pawn in this conversation and that Putin may disappear. The concern I've had is, is if Russia falls apart, will people leave and you'll get five, that five million immigrants out of Russia to Europe? And people I know basically say, no, the Russians won't leave. They'll just stay and suffer through like they normally do. So if Putin drops dead or something like that, or I think it's Russia stays where Russia is and that really it's China. What is China doing to open up the trans route routes to get stuff out of Europe? 
which is really where I've been thinking. I the Dale Day battlefield and what's going to happen there. Um, I don't think it's going to go nuclear. I think that they're going to just grind it out and keep battling away at some level, and maybe they'll decide. I, I don't know what will precipitate a peace, but they'll, they'll just keep grinding away at each other um, until they get tired of it or until China sees a reason to flip the switch. If the U.S. gets more kinetic, you know, I think uh, some investor was saying U.S. should go all in and get kinetic here. Um, then I think China moves on Taiwan. Um, that, that would get nuts. Yeah, <laughs> but generally, I've never. China really has not been in a battle of any sort since Korea, and everything I read out of Chinese doctrine is not. They would much rather win on an economic front than, and so all the buildups of their military technology. I think is more paper tiger. It's material, it's important, but it's all paper tiger. All the hypersonics that they're talking about are really bad doctrine in terms of military battle because they don't have enough of them. And um, so I, I generally perceive that China's intention to get us to spend a lot of money uh, on military and that they'll win on economics. I mean, well, I like the balloon. You, I mean, we've had the balloon. You want to talk about the balloon? Yeah, what do you know? Well, so there's no reconnaissance value of the balloon. I've got friends who are in the military. It's like, oh, I think they're going to send an EMP over. It's like, it's a dumb way to send an EMP over. I, uh, It's a dumb reconnaissance platform. Uh, it's not that maneuverable. Um, during Russia, when, in the 50s, we sent 500 balloons over Russia like in a month. I mean, it, it's not like we didn't use balloons, but the... I heard some senators say, well, you can't get signals intelligence from space. So they had to do this. That's bullshit. Of course you can get signals intelligence from space. And so the whole conversation about this platform, when looking at the platform, I don't understand what its reconnaissance value is. It didn't seem to have any electro-optical sensors on it from what I could see of it. Maybe they had an antenna sensor. If you don't think that there's a Chinese spy sitting outside every single one of our base listening to our signals intelligence, um, you're asleep at the switch. So if they want to monitor electronic intelligence coming out of our bases, they're, uh, they must already be there. I would be. And then the reconnaissance value is minor in terms of uh, an optical sensor. And it didn't seem like they had an optical sensor. There was no practical optical sensor that I saw on that platform. And you would have seen one. You would have seen something of some size or you would have seen a LIDAR sensor of some size which was not visible at all on that platform. I think why they did it, maybe, is um, to pay attention to what goes on TikTok. I mean, what, what are the Chinese very good at? The Chinese understand how to get messages out and understand sentiment and push things around and understand sentiment. So if, if, I, if I wanted to influence people, I would create an event and then I would have, I'd, I'd own a social network. <laughs> I have a social network out there. I'd create the event and then I'd have my agents inside that social networking, pushing things around and creating creating a test. And I'd, I'd use it for an A-B test to say, if this thing happens, how does it propagate through and how do people react and how do I affect sentiment to create confusion? Um. And so I, I honestly, if it was anything, I think it was, you know, let's see what happens when we do something crazy over the United States and how it propagates through TikTok. Yeah. Andy, you hear anything on your end? What are you hearing? No, I, I, I think we, you know, it's a kind of a cavalier attitude to say, you know, and I don't think they'll do anything nuclear. I mean, <laughs> You push anyone too far into a corner, and particularly a guy like Putin, and, and it, it makes me nervous. And and I think that you know events could get out of hand quickly if if the wrong things were to occur. So I, I think it's every bit as serious as l literally the Bay of Pigs. And uh, you know, hopefully, cool heads, cooler heads prevail. But you know, we we we're, we've been poking this bear for multiple years now and moving closer and closer to their borders. I mean, 
for us to be doing what we're doing in Ukraine versus would be the equivalent of them doing the same thing in Canada and expecting us to sit back and do nothing. I mean, it, it wouldn't happen. So I, I am, I'm a little more concerned about the, uh, the, the possibilities uh, when it comes to Russia. Uh, I think China's a longer term game. Um, I don't think they're here to do anything yesterday or, the, or, the, or tomorrow, but uh, they're learning how the world's reacting to Russia. So, you know, I think they got kind of a, if they were going to go into Taiwan, they're probably rethinking that at least for now. They got their own issues and economic problems and uh, population problems to contend with. Um, certainly the real estate market, they have a, a, an economy like most of the world that hasn't realized yet in shambles. So I don't think they're here to do anything in that regard in the very near future. Um, and why Russia or why China sent the balloons, who the hell knows? Maybe they're <laughs> just just for something to do, just for, for giggles. It probably was. They're probably laughing their ass off about the whole thing. I just think that an F-22 was up there, a $200 million object is up there shooting down something with a, is just sort of, I don't know. Right. Right. So. Yeah. Just an F-15, it works perfectly fine. Yeah. It's my, my McDonnell Douglas bias. F-15 is a cool aircraft. So, so as it would pertain to the grain markets or the ag markets, I mean, it's kind of a double-edged sword, I would suspect, wouldn't you agree? I mean, if Russia escalates and goes more extreme, I, I suspect the market rallies. Wheat probably leads the way, followed by corn, obviously, and it pulls beans higher and, and the other markets higher. If it escalates to a degree that sucks China in and, and pulls China in direct opposition to us, it probably negates it and uh, it's a little bit bearish because, you know, China's obviously the world's biggest buyer of beans and corn, and I, I don't know what type of embargoes and sanctions would be placed on China. I don't know. It'd get pretty nuts. So it seems weird. I would probably, I guess, be a buyer on the first news and sell the son of a bitch if it escalates too far. I, I don't know. I don't know. It sounds, I don't know. It's too hard to trade these war headlines, don't you think, Andy? I mean, oh, it's impossible. Hard. It really is. I mean, you have no edge, and, and, and as a trader, if I, if I don't have an edge in something or I believe I have an edge in something, I, I, it's a fool's errand. There's no reason to try to trade for the, uh, you may as well go to Vegas and you probably have certainly have better odds because you, you, you can't anticipate or predict, but you can also be, you have to be somewhat defensive. And for that reason, I'm maintaining, you know, my uh, short pos hedge positions in the uh, S and P's and the uh, NASDAQ. Um, I, I just can't not do that. And I can't not have some, form of coverage in the form of uh, metals on either. Uh, they haven't been fun to live with for the last few weeks. Um, but but generally speaking, I think the, uh, the, the they're a must have, just like you have to have a little bit of long wheat, um, just as a, as a what if trade and, and, and as a protection against the rest of your portfolio and assets. So, so metals, what you, energy. Yeah, what are you thinking? And, um, NASDAQ. What are you thinking with the economy? You think we're rocky roads ahead and higher? No, I don't. And higher I, interest rates? Yeah. I, I think interest rates are going to get higher and stay higher, and they're going to stay higher longer than anyone th thinks. I think the market is trading uh, interest rates coming down by the end of the year, and I think that's wrong. I think you got to believe Powell in what he says, and he's going to remain hawkish. And uh, there's just too many other signals out there pointing to inflation's not going away. Uh, the, the, the full employment scenario um, is an awful hard thing to get rid of. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy as wages uh, have to work higher and, and uh, battle with, uh, with inflation. So I, I don't see anything that tells me that we're coming off the, um, I, 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 you know, call me crazy, but I still, I still don't think the lows are in the stock market. I saw that uh, there were a couple of traders yesterday were talking that the market's never posted its low uh, ahead of the two-year peak. And the two-year just peaked again yesterday. So, you know, it's kind of, it is kind of interesting. They said the stock market has never made its low ahead of the, uh, before the two-year peak. So it's like, you know, just posted new highs yesterday on the two-year. The one-year posted a new high as well. And so, I, you know, it, it's, I don't know. I, I heard this morning too, uh, I guess Andy Jassy, you know, the CEO of Amazon took Bezos, but 
they said they were calling back employees to three days a week. And yeah. the bigger, higher, up, and I guess there's going to be a, a damn coup at uh, Amazon. People are losing their minds and they're saying they're going to protest and, you know. And but yeah, I'm sorry. So is that like they three days a week and they work a 15 hour day or is that three days a week, eight hours? No, just three days a week in the office, you know, and you're other Oh, two I got it, got it, got it, got it. But they're just blowing up about it. And I'm like, holy shit. Did kind you like Disney. They're having the same headaches, aren't they, Kev? Yeah. I I saw a little noise that questioned the employment numbers that they that maybe the Secretary of Labor resigned because he thought we were cooking the books on the employment numbers. Did you hear that at all? I heard that a little bit. That they're better than they should be. No, that they that they overstated the employment and they were they were fiddling with the the numbers uh, making uh, them better. I always sort of wonder how much that's. Well, that was very coincidental timing for the State of the Union address. So, yeah. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that's out of line or character of this administration. That's for sure. I, I will say, I will tell you this: a little bird put in my ear, or I should say, my daughter. She survived another round of cuts at one of the biggest architect firms in the U.S. So. I'm letting you know. I mean, they cut in San Francisco. They made two cuts. They cut in Chicago. They laid people off in the D.C. office, and then they laid people off in the New York office. And they were laying people off that weren't just new people. They laid off uh, uh, some associates and higher up people that had been there 12, 15 years, she said. So I'm letting you know when an architect, big, big architect, because they're the one that did, uh, they've done a bunch of airports and a bunch of state, you know, they're doing the big, big. She's she's fortunately on a couple of big government jobs uh, with huge, huge budgets. But so she's probably pretty safe. But, you know, when you see architect firms, they just said nothing's breaking ground. The things that they had in place aren't breaking. People backed them up, putting them, delaying them quite a bit. I think that rolls over to construction in maybe six months is what we'd seen in previous times. You've seen big architect firms lay off. Uh, I mean, that's. You know, it's kind of, you know, there there would be early, early in the game, and then it'll probably spill forward, is my opinion. So I would say six months, seven months, it's could be a little tricky on that on some things. So I don't know. It's interesting. So are you bullish or bearish? Shit, I can't be bullish right here. I mean, I I've got a short position on in in the S and P and short some Nasdaq. I still long some stocks in like four hundred one ks and IRAs, so I'm kind of hedged against it uh, that way, but. I'm with you. I mean, it just seems every, it's so hard to sit here and do nothing, though, isn't it? It just pisses me off when you watch the thing. <laughs> rally. You watch it rally and take off and then you fear you're going to miss that. You know, you've been patient. And that, it's just so hard to sit and do nothing. It's just mentally just tough. But I think it's probably the smart play right here. I mean, same with housing. I mean, like I told you, Michelle, and I tried to buy a couple different things uh, a few different times in the last few months. Shit, there's just no inventory. And I'm telling you, prices are not breaking. Well, hell, you're down in Naples. You see it firsthand. I mean, I still believe prices have to break. I mean, at some point, somebody's got to get an ass kick. I mean, so, somewhere there has to be a break and uh, just to cleanse things out. And I got to believe the Fed's trying to make that happen. And I don't want to bet against them. I mean, I think eventually you get rates high enough to where you strangle off some of this growth. And like you said, you got to slow wages down. And 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 I don't know how you do that either. So I don't know. Seems tricky. Carter, what's your thoughts? You bullish? I'm not bullish. I'm bullish on innovation, but uh, I'm, you know, it's a great time for the venture world to invest. This is where all the great companies are created. So we're watching out the people who can't deal with it. And uh, this is the time to be looking at new innovations. So, and historically, I mean, on that front, historically, some of the greatest uh, investments in companies. We're born in times of distress yeah. and, 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 and of economic uncertainty and when things really start to pull back. I think it's going to be interesting now, though, as we're now in a time of uh, no longer free money. What is our take on that? Say with some of our current investments that we to let everyone know, Andy and I are, uh, you know, we invested in the founding partners with iSelect in their uh, in Carter and in, in their business and you know, we take a look at a lot of early stage investments, let Carter kind of explain it. And we're going to roll out the fund to our clients and farmers and people in agriculture across the U.S. I've 
been lucky enough to have Carter introduce me to many new ag tech startups over the last few years. Uh, I've invested. Uh, some have been good. Some have been not so good. Uh, hey, but you know, we're, there's still time on the table. But what's going to happen, Carter, with some of the just take a Benson, for example. Hell, let's just talk about it. Um, as everyone knows, we're, we're heavily invested in Benson Hill, Andy, myself, yeah. Carter. What happens so, when they don't pencil in, uh, you know, no money's not free anymore. I mean, is that, how's that impact some of these companies? Well, so is the, you asking me for the bull case or the bear case? I uh, maybe. Well, I'm just saying what, what's, what are some of these ag tech startups who were borrowing money at next to nothing now have to pencil in, you know, a pretty high rate. Yeah, I think that uh, I'm not sure how to answer. A lot of our companies are all equity based, so they don't have to borrow a lot of money. Benson does have their crush facility; they do have to worry about that. So I think that the uh, a problem, a problem in venture capital in ag tech is once a company gets to like a Series D, they typically have to buy a lot more infrastructure than Instagram, okay. and so there's no AWS for for crushing. Uh, and so that's a challenge, but relatively there's a huge amount of capital that wants to come in into this space. So on a relative basis, I think that the capital is making itself available at higher rates. Um, the coverage on it is a pain in the ass, but I, I think if I were in real estate versus agriculture, I'd probably want to be in agriculture um, in terms of if you're talking about debt uh but you know they'll, they'll fight their way through it somehow to get it to work and then other capacity will open up somehow and you know i don't know if i've got a real clear sight on that but we are working in in terms of we're we're actually looking at whether we should help facilitate creating an ag infrastructure reit so if you look at like um app harvest app harvest just did a lease buyback Everyone thought App Harvest was going to go out of business. App Harvest is doing hydroponic tomatoes. And they did a lease buyback that also involved um, a nice offtake agreement. So a family office came in and put $120 million into it. And really, that's the right thing to have happened in that business model for a long time. They were funding that with equity. So the big family offices have capital. There's a tremendous amount of cash available by people at that side of the business. And so it it will, people, you know, App Harvest is taking haircuts on that. But that's what happens at this point. I mean, it, there were 50 competitors to Amazon in 2000 and they got cleaned out. So mm -hmm. the company, I, I think the bull case on Benson is they work their ass off to get it through. They're good operators. So they work their ass off to get through. 15 of their competitors get wiped out in the process because they're on the other side. Benson's got a bunch of quarters under their belt and the markets come back and people are familiar with it. And familiarity leads to people more willing to invest with them in the public markets. And then they've, they get the war chest at that point. I'm talking like two years from now, they have the war chest at that point to invest and bring other technologies to market. So Google was originally a search company and then they bought Android and they bought Google Mail and they bought Google Maps and they bought and they and they built their thing out. And so I think that you know my longer term view is that yeah. um near term I don't know it's you know it's a fist fight in the field and um get together with the best operators. How long ago did we start investing in Benson? Excuse me? How long ago did we start investing in Benson? The first investments in Benson were 2014. At, on today's price, probably were around uh, 40 cents, 42 cents a share. And I think it's probably trading, unfortunately, around 230, 240. Yeah. So, I got into 45 cents, Carter. 45 cents. So I think there was a little bit of... Um, those numbers moved around a teeny bit when we did the went public. The share ratio changed a teeny bit, but called forty five cents. And so investors who are that are up. Um, I think we're, you know, sometimes if you ever take the Amazon curve, Amazon and play it out to its long curve, 
there was a long period of time where Amazon really looked like a crappy investment. But if you invested at, ben, at Amazon at the open in 13 years, you were up 100x. In 24 years, you're up 1,000x. You know, get 1,000x in the in the market is like 70 years. Um, and the advantage, I think the advantage, I think you, I mean, you tell me is understanding how the market may play out. You know, the more and more I'm reminded with private market investing, you you start to get a sense of how the market may play out. And so you're prepared for the when the market turns your way and it gives you some advantage. It doesn't like I don't know. I know someone open invested at the open on Amazon and held, and she's pretty happy. Um but <laughs> but knowing when to have invested in Amazon, um people in the private markets who start on the private markets have a better idea on what to do. And if you're at a 45 basis points on Benson, you've still got some you've still got more than enough room. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful, but, but we've been at it for a while. And I think that no matter what, everybody's got to eat every day. And Benson's about reducing the cost of protein. We're spending $1.9 trillion on the, to get diabetes each year or treat diabetes. And that's, that's a lot of money. Um, and that's going to break at some point because that'll go to Two trillion or three trillion, and the government can't cover that. So to let everyone know, I mean, on the ag side of things, I mean, we were, you know, early investing in things like Benson Hill, Holganics, Earth Optics was a new recent one. Uh, you know, various ones. Um, what's the one that uh, actually went and got bought out? I can't. What is it? Benz, Daniel? Uh, yeah, you what was it? Benz, or, or you? Couldn't hear you. Herbal. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, herbal. We just had uh, said Vence was a uh, Mark bought Vence, and that was a really nice return. And they they did sort of um, dog fences for beef for free range beef. What is that like? That collar thing that you do for your dog? That was a, but that was also bought because they've it's got a regenerative farming component to it. It was a nice markup. That was a. Um, the, on the digital side, things that are more digital um, are there's a lot of appetite by the and we should see. So one thing about the interest rates coming down is companies. It's more expensive. I'm sorry, interest rates going up is it's more expensive for companies to do stock buybacks. And so I would expect, and we're hearing this from the iBanks, is everybody's repositioning really to see a lot of acquisitions at the end of the end of the period end of the year, especially in biologics. So biologics. Um, the, the general sense is all the majors want to have a biologic answer in their, so like a whole organic yeah. want a biologics answer in their in their mix, and that they're taking that more seriously. And so we've heard some of the I banks thinking hard about should they help Nutrient and all those people execute some acquisitions in those spaces. So that might be you might see some interesting transitions going on there. So, yeah. So to let people know, I mean, uh, people come to Carter with wanting money uh, for their business or their business idea. Carter and his team do their due diligence, uh, you know, really look behind the curtains under the hood to to try and select early stage investments that they see that are promising and, and have potential to push, uh, you know, to, I guess, be a difference maker and, uh, and, and change things. And so Andy and I are invested in that. I, I believe, I don't want to speak for Andy, but I think he throws a little bit of money at, at, at almost every deal that comes down the pipe, don't you, Andy? I mean, I know you look at a few and don't, but. Well, yeah, I think uh, of the 50, how many are on the platform now? 56 or 56? I think it's 60 maybe altogether, but okay, yeah, right. I'll go with you. Uh, it's a little hard to keep track of most of the children. Right, right. Um, but but I, I think I'm invested in 49. So I, I, I tend to, you know, you can sit there and pick and choose. That's why it's called I select, but I find it um, helpful to, to try to take the due diligence that they do and, and accept it. And uh, unless I have some real significant reasons for not doing something uh, and I significant being uh, 
um, maybe not liking the, the, the cap of the opportunity or whatever the case may be, um, I, I tend to do most all of them. And then I can weight what I like better uh, by, by increasing the uh, investment size. So, so, I do so initially, you don't, initially, you don't have to throw a ton of money at it. No, do as little as what, 5,000 bucks or 10 grand, five, 10 grand. Yeah, yeah it's like the smallest, we, we typically, so uh, to put some numbers behind this. So we've been investing since 2014. We've invested in uh, a little bit more than 60 companies. We have 500 individual investors, uh, LPs, 500. Uh, they typically are high net worth individuals. So people that are worth 5 million or more, uh, institutional investors, things of that sort. Um, we have deployed about $200 million. We have looked at more than 4,000 companies. So we've invested in 16, looked at 4,000. Uh, when you, when we think that what we look at and say no to is a lot of information in there. Uh, our investors are really sophisticated investors, sort of think about I select uh, some of the Yale endowment models. So we invest in venture capital for its optionality. And that means that Andy can, on the early stage portfolio, invest across 20, 30 companies and and get a return on that. And then two or three of those really get strong and really look great. And he can, at that point, instead of just being really diversified, he can say, you know what, I'm gonna put a lot of money behind these two or three out of the 20. So that's an option. And then when it goes public, he's been paying attention to it for whatever, four or five years, and he can make that decision of, hey, have I seen enough private market information here that when it's public that maybe I can make a judgment that there's an ARB here. And then all the companies we pass on are also provide information. And so we we have investors that want to know what we are investing in and what we're not. And really, I think, so getting that information, we all have access to public market information. But what we're starting to do, the evolution of what we're doing at iSelect is we're saying innovation is a better thing. Uh, not positive the government knows what to do. We're not positive the big companies wouldn't know what to do. But if you had to bet your life, would you bet on Elon Musk or would you bet on somebody at Bigco? And uh, so innovators have a role. They've done great things in our country. They've done great things for the world. They've saved us a lot of money, all those kinds of things. So innovation is better. And then the question is, is how do we make it easier for Andy and you to invest? And we, oddly, that's hard. The SEC wants to make sure that we're good with you. And that's hard. And we've spent some time. So now we're, we figured out all that. And we are, rather than just making this available to people that are worth more than 5 million, we're coming out with a product that we call the rolling fund or ag, ag tag one is the first one of these. And that will allow anybody who's an accredited investor to go to their phone and invest $25,000, $50,000. They can invest out of their IRA. They can invest directly and invest in the next 20 deals that we do. Uh, and then they can do that again and again and again, and and they can they can invest just like you guys are investing. Yeah, and to to let everyone know, I mean, if you've heard of Peter Thiel or Reed Hoffman, you know, and you see the stories where they invested in Facebook or Netflix before they ever went public or anything like. I mean, that's the gist. But we're trying to do it in the ag world with ag and nutrition and things that are going to help change healthcare uh, and change you know, a lot of the, uh, like I said, the ag healthcare and nutrition space. And we think there's going to be massive, massive potential over the next 20, 30 years in that front. I mean, Carter, myself, Andy, we see a lot of game changing innovation. I know Andy's doing some of these things for legacy plays. I am as well to, to leave my kids in a better position. Hopefully one day ask Carter one day, I said, what the hell's the end? What's the end result off all this shit, Carter? What do we do? And he says, well, hopefully your kids and their kids will be clipping coupons, uh, you know, for, for the rest of their lives. And, and hopefully that's uh, where it plays out to. So I think that's the longer term game that's plan right. for all of us. I mean, certainly no one would suggest going out and putting all of your money into things like this. I think it's for accredited investors or, or folks that are looking. Uh, I have people call all the time. Hey, what can I do with 50,000, a hundred thousand where, you know, and, they're just looking for places to to push some things. 
if you look at ADM, like Soren was saying, Soren Schroeder, our good friends, also uh, invested uh, with Ice Lake. You know, like Soren was saying, you know, Bungie, Cargill, ADM, they all have uh, teams of people that are early stage investors. You saw Tyson invest in, uh, uh, what was it, uh, Beyond? The yeah, me too. Yeah, we, co- we and co-invest with ADM. We co-invest with Cargill. We co-invest with Bungie. Uh, we co-invest with Jim Simons from Renaissance. We co-invest with the Walton family. Um, so you'll people who invest in this platform can do that. It is important to your point. This is a long-term investment. It's more like what I'm going to do for retirement. It's more 10 years out. It's, it's more like 3% of your portfolio, not 70% of your portfolio. And you should, you should really think about that. And, and I'm glad to talk to talk to people about that. The idea is to make it available so people it, it wasn't available. And just you you also see this, you know, there are two carters in this world. There's us and there's Carter Malloy in terms of Acre Trader. Both of us are are trying to figure out how to make it so that anybody can make the decision if they want to, to, to remove the barriers. The other thing I'm excited about is if if we have people investing, they if they're already a customer for some of these things, why shouldn't they be able to invest in it? Or or vice versa, Carter, or vice yeah. versa. I mean, that's what I was wanting to say is I went to Carter and said, look, I got a ton of my families that own ag retail operations, large ag retail, large elevator operations. You know, they would love to, or large farms, they would love to invest in these things and use the product. I mean, they could have been early with Benson. They could have been early at using Holganics. They could have been early with using Earth Optic, you know, and it allows you to see a lot of that. And that's what's an advantage to me, just writing the newsletter and, and going out and speaking. I get an advantage of seeing some of the early technology as it comes down the pipe through Carter and Iselec. So if you're an ag retailer or you're a large, you know, someone who's heavily invested in agriculture, I think it's a no-brainer to throw money to see the deck and see what's coming down the pipe in the ag tech space. So, I mean, to me, it's, it only makes sense. And the thing we always say, often I say, what, you know, what does every startup need? And people are like money. It's like, no, they need customers. They've got customers. They will make money and organics, organics working with you and working with people in farming, agriculture has learned how to make a better product and a better business. Well, and that helps people improve yield, but why shouldn't they have a piece of the action? When we look at Fairlife, I, I've been talking about Fairlife a, a lot. That was a milk co-op. They corporatized it. They came up with a unique product. They came up with this nice quality, density, low sugar, great drink that a lot of people use in sports drink. And they sold it for like a billion dollars to Coke. So the the idea, the opportunity, I, I'm not saying you're going to get a billion dollars off of these investments, but the so the, the returns, as, as we drive innovation, which we're going to see a lot of innovation in agriculture, we have to. We, we've got to almost double protein production by 2050 to meet global demand. The U.S. needs to be that person. Why the hell shouldn't the farmers and the people in the agribusiness who are the early adopters of this technology get the option to invest in the technology and ride along both as a user of the technology and as a as a investor in the technology. And so that's what we're making available with the app. We're, we've got an app. You can go to the iPhone or, or Android store. You can download it. It's the first version of the app. You can go ahead and make investments that way. We're going to do more to it so that you can see products that you can say, I'm looking for, there's going to be a version of chat GVT in it shortly, where you can say, I'm looking for these things. I'm interested in doing these things and it will give you some guidance. And so what we're trying to produce here is an opportunity to invest and an opportunity to understand what the newest technology is so that we can make agriculture in the United States more competitive. Um, that producers can get in more profitability and then you can sort of plot out your retirement a little bit better. So that's what we're, that's what we're up to with this thing. And Kevin's going to join the investment committee on it. Um, so that we can make yeah. sure. That- so, so walk someone through how it works. So let's say I'm new to all this. 
I want to invest in some of these ag tech startups. I need to be an accredited investor, obviously. And so I go through that paperwork, sign that. And then I send 25 grand, 50 grand, 100 grand. Let's say I send 50 grand in. Yeah. To open my account. What happens next? So we'll take that 50 grand and we'll divide it by 20 and we'll invest that amount into the next, each one of the next 20 deals. Okay. Um, the the next 20 time. deals that you, myself, the rest of the committee. Yes. I'm sorry. We, so we go through a diligence process. We meet with five, six, seven companies a week. We look at those companies. We have a team that's been doing this for now since 2014. They, they, they look at the deals as those deals come along and they, they call on Soren or Andy or people Me. that used to be at Benson Hill or whatever. And they, we ask for their help and we, we go through about a two month process of diligence. And then towards the tail end of that diligence process, we've sort of weeded it down to a few. And then we have an investment committee and the investment committee is sort of the final group that says, okay, do we think this is suitable for the investors? This is right. Is the price right? We, we go through that final, after we've done 60, 70 hours of diligence, we go through a final evaluation amongst our senior team and, and, and you'll be involved in that in this case and look at it and say, is this the right thing? Uh, does it make sense? And when we're making that evaluation, we're thinking about like, is it going to return a good value over the next five, six, seven years? Is it going to give us an opportunity to invest more later? And, you know, can we, can we <laughs> sort of buy an option? Let's buy into 20 companies with the idea that three of them might be really successful. Not that all of them are going to be successful. Like six of them are going to just fail out, fail at some point. But, but some are going to be successful. Some are going to fail. And, and so at that point, when we make the decision, yes, we're going to take one twentieth of your fifty thousand dollars and invest it in that company, and then we'll. Do Carter, it. Carter, let me ask you this: So, if I if I come in and, and it's a new company uh, and it's a, an A round or a seed round, uh, so you start out, you may invest in a seed round, then a B round, A round, then a B, then a C, then you know after you get past the D, usually you're either acquired or. You know, you de-risk it as the higher up the uh, the the level of rounds you go. Would would this investment be just for early stage, or might you be looking at um, part of that going into a B or a C round, a, a later stage company? We allow. Uh, we're going to generally bias towards earlier stage, but we the, this fund in ag tech because we're making it around ag tech is that right. will allow. Uh, this is the decision we'll make at the investment committee. Is we the some of the follow-on rounds will be able to make those. It's permitted to make those allocations. We're we're trying to make sure you get a good return, and so we got to do a return calculation. But this particular, where many of our investors just do early and some do just late, this particular fund allows us to do both. Oh, good. And, and the committee will make that decision. I mean, she is correct. So, what, real life examples? Say Earth Optics. What they do? Was that a B round? Go I ahead. think that. Uh, let's say yes. It was a big let's just say yes. So yeah. let's say, and I, and then uh, we get a person that comes into the fund and they would like to participate in the C round if it comes available again. Can, is that something that you're saying possibly that could be? That's, the, uh, the investment committee will make that decision and, right. and we're allowed to in this fund to do early and late. Yeah, makes sense. Cool. Yeah, that'd be good. And then what we'll do is what we're trying to do is uh, is make it so that. I uh, maybe two years from now you do this again. Yeah. So, hey, I'm gonna do twenty five, fifty thousand now, and then I want to do some more later, and and we're gonna offer try to offer this fund up more often. Um, it's a little bit. It's a it's a thing that the SC thing that SEC did that's a, called a rolling fund, and we can't take more than two hundred and fifty investors or ten million dollars. Okay. I don't know where they came up with that, but that's what it is. And so it's called the rolling fund and we can do those multiple times. And, uh, Carter, it also allows people to whet their appetite without a great deal of uh, yeah. financial input. And if they like that, then they could open, uh, you mentioned their 500 uh, individual 
account holders within uh, iSelect. I mean, they could open an individual account and then be able to add on to something that they like that they were in the fund re with regards to, correct? Yeah, yes. Or so, I mean, it's yeah. not okay. just, a, it's just not a one and done. There, there are other ways to come into something if they like something specific that's that, that you guys put into this, the, the, the ag tech one, um, they could come in later and, and do it individually. Yeah, Wait. so we'll, uh, go ahead, Andy. Uh, Kevin. Andy, do you, do you, you told me before you send Roth money, huh? What's that? You you invest Roth money, correct? You keep I have up. invested Roth money in some, yes. Yeah, okay. Just so you can def do deferred, you can do an IRA. It's like it's a little bit more involved, but you can. Yeah. And it's not a bad idea. I mean, yeah, I like yeah, I like Andy's idea on the Roth because if it blows up and it, it's a huge winner, well shit, you're not paying the taxes on it. So I mean, it, yeah, I mean, who's got the biggest IRA in the world? Who? Mitt Romney. Peter Thiel. Mitt Romney, he 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 took money, stuck it in his IRA when he was at Bain and put like five million of stuff. And that's worth like, I don't know, it's worth a lot. <laughs> and he's gonna pass it all of his kids tax free. Other yeah, than I thought I thought Peter Thiel did that with uh with PayPal oh, yeah, or something. And, and, and he made billions that, that he, Peter, he can request. Peter may have beat out may have beat, beat out um Romney. So the so a couple things we're gonna be able to do. So one is we'll do like an ag tech one and then we'll do an ag tech two and ag tech three. We've got other people who are like really worried about diabetes, so we might do a diabetes one. And so we can sort of fiddle with these a little bit and really be thematic. That's one thing. The other thing is you you've been and we're working on this. So you you really have shown me the rally app and like, hey, I can see these different things, I can show them to people. So a, a thing we want to do with the app that we're not there yet is if you're an investor in this, you'll be you'll get down to a point of saying these are the companies I'm an investor with, and you sit down and having dinner with somebody. It's like here's some new technology that you should be thinking about. So if there's no reason why, uh, I, you know, if you're an investor, the information should be right there. So if you run into somebody that says you should use organics or you should use Earth Optics, I mean, why not let investors tell other people about these things? It's a little bit like that. What's that? Wasn't there like an E-Trade commercial where that, where he was out shopping for shoes and was an investor? So how do we get in, if agriculture want, agriculture is incredibly competitive in the United States. And when I was at Boeing, I, I worked with the CTO trying to get the whole rest of Boeing, trying to understand what new technologies we had available to make it competitive. And and part of my thinking is like, we're, we're, we're seeing all these opportunities to some of them are good ideas and some of them are bad ideas, but how do we help agriculture get a sense of what's coming along? And instead of it just coming from Syngenta, is, is there a way for us to summarize and tell people about what's coming? And so the, the thing I need a little bit of help going forward from you guys and other people is like, what else can we stick into this so that, that people invest, they have an opportunity to skin in the game and then, if they can work, if if we can help these companies get customers and succeed, they get that benefit, and then it helps improve and makes agriculture more competitive. And so that's innovation is better. Yeah. Well, just speaking for myself, I mean, the fact that I'm in over forty eight or nine companies has really opened my eyes to so many other things that I never would have seen or been a participant in had I not have been watching and, and, and going through the whole due diligence process and looking at all, all the uh, work that you guys have done to bring these onto the platform. So I, I find it stimulating to say the least and uh, very eye-opening that um, it's, it's opened my eyes to so many things that I never would have been involved in otherwise. So And they, that, the companies you. having your input and insight helps them do their job better. So they the why do people need customers they need it for revenue but they also need it for the customers to say okay it's really cool that you've got those hundred things you want to do but my life i would be able to be more profitable in agriculture if if you could do these 10 things first and that feedback system helps uh, here's a, mm -hmm. a a little secret on innovation invention is a fraction of the effort to adoption adoption is much harder 
you know, Netscape didn't change very much between when it was introduced to when people, everybody understood what it was. We, I think I told a story about we went, we built a bunker buster bomb at McDonnell Douglas in like 90 days. At, um, and it took procurement years to figure out how to buy it. Um, and commercial products, a lot of the things that people invent, the greatest entrepreneurs have figured out ahead of time, but getting it into the market and getting people to adopt it. So the adoption phase is really a, how you can speed things up. Um, we have a theme song. We Our theme song at iSelect is uh, from Hamilton, the song in the room where it happens. Jeez. Remember that? Did you ever see Hamilton? The, in the room where it happens, it's it's a it's a scene where Hamilton's like in with Thomas Jefferson in Washington, and he where the sausage gets made, and they're getting this kind. Con- they're trying to figure out how to do something in the federal government anyway. But but the the idea of like how do we bring agriculture, bring Mac Crisp from Benson Hill, bring agriculture and bring money, I select and bring the talent of the people who've been around it, you guys and Soren and and folks like that, and get them closer together so that we speed this process up. And and that's that's the mission that we're on at iSelect. And I think that's what Andy's comment, you know, if you invest or if you're going to invest, there's also a lot of ancillary things that come out of that. Like Andy says, we're introduced to a lot of new people. We've met a lot of new um, people with great ideas who have introduced us to something else that led to something else. So, you know, you come be kind of, kind of become part of a little country club, I guess, or some some just like uh, Carter saying there, and you bring a lot of people together. You get invest, you get invited to a lot of investor days, or get to see a lot of things. Yeah. And I, I think it's you know it's definitely money well spent for for my family, uh, it, money well invested uh, for my family and the kids <laughs> and things of that nature. So yeah, do I we, definitely tip my hat to Carter. And I, 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 I do have to restate the caveats because we we operate under the SEC rules, so it's you got to make a sensible decision. We're, we're offering it as an option. Um, don't just jump off the cliff and do it, which, but those are all the caveats and we're, we're trying to make it, it's not going to be, you know, we got it into an app, which takes a lot actually to get done well. And it's going to be a little bit of effort. So bear with us, but um, you can download it. You go to the iPhone store, look up, I select, go to the play store, look up, I select, you can download it. And we'll be adding more features to it. Um, there's a feedback button up in the menu to say, you know, guys, can you add this? Uh, but we want to build this with you. So, yeah, and either call Carter at iSelect or you guys can call my office. We're not licensed to do anything. So I'm just going to take and forward your info to Carter and his team and they'll get back with you guys. So just to let you know, I mean, if you need or if you get lost, can't figure out how to, to get a hold of uh, iSelect, call, uh, call our office or shoot me an email now. It on we, we cannot take more than 250 investors um or 10 million dollars in the first one um and uh so that'll fill up yeah i think i'll be good so it's exciting right. it's uh yeah, heck yeah what's uh make what, agriculture more profitable <laughs> exactly we need some hats made garden I do. Should we get a low should we get a hat? Can you make <laughs> some hats? Can we can you come up with a can you exactly. guys come up with uh, something to give out to everybody for everybody who's an investor? That's right. We'll hit Jordan up and tell him we need some hats. So too funny. <laughs> so Andy, what else you got going on? Anything? Any new investments or nothing right now? No, no. Just uh, just playing a little bit of pickleball and uh, golf yeah. and enjoying the nice weather. But Good deal. In between, deal. Uh, uh, I try to find a little time to do that. I find myself sitting here at the computer more than I should, but that's okay too. No, I hear you. Carter, anything new? No. Any sailing trips or anything? Nothing? No sailing trips. I, I'm. Uh, this is preoccupied my time a little bit. I, I would like to get some travel going on, but uh, nothing exciting. I might get down to see Andy in a, in a few weeks, but I... Uh, in the heat of it yeah heck yeah we need to come down there andy i, I still need to get over there you do yeah we were yep. on the other yeah we were on the east side so we'll, uh, we're really intrigued about uh we were to set something up down and get together around building an agri but i think we might have to delay that meeting but uh it would be nice nice to get out i need a vacation i'm not sure where to go though <laughs> we got to figure out where to go. 
It, it, uh, it's overly crowded in Southern Florida. Just let me tell you, Andy, is it crowded as hell down there? Oh yeah, it really is. Yeah. Hey, I'm telling you. Yeah. It, COVID did one thing. It, it, it opened people's eyes to, as you mentioned, uh, being able to work remotely is a big deal. And where, you, you know, the, the, the freedom to um, live in a, in, in a uh, tax-free environment is very appealing to a lot of people as well as uh, uh, getting out of the, uh, the Northern uh, winter, environment so you're finding more and more people coming down and making it permanent not just seasonal like the snowbirds of of old because of uh in COVID I think opened a lot of people's eyes to that so I, I, I told you they, uh, I told you they uh they briefed Michelle and I demographically how it's kind of set up down there I said we were over her brother lives in Fort Lauderdale so we looked at a house in Boca and uh People were like, what the hell are you doing moving to Boca? And I said, what the hell? I don't, I mean, it looked like a nice place to me. And they're like, ah, man, that's where all the East Coasters, that's where all the New Yorkers go on that East Coast side. All the Midwesterners go on the Gulf side over there. That's true. That's true. From my ears down to Fort Lauderdale, you know, and all the way, I should say, down to where you're at in Naples. So, yeah, they kind of briefed me on uh, where I should be, I guess. They said, you're, yeah. not, you're not supposed to be over there. So, I break that down. Was fun. Yeah. The breakdown in Florida. I thought that was a classic. So who knows? But yeah, well, hey, Carter, I appreciate your time, Andy. Yeah, no, I don't thank know you anything. for all. Oh, look, uh, we started on this journey maybe in 2015 at FarmCon, and and uh, we're driven by the fact of how to make uh, agriculture better, and we want to make some money at the same time. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Heck yeah. Any parting words? Anybody? No, no, we're good. Got your eyes it. looking a lot better, I can tell you. Yeah, I'm getting better toward the corniest shit. Who knows what happened? I, I'll, uh, yeah, maybe we'll have Joel on next time, Andy. We'll talk to Joel Ross and uh, some of the other guys. And Carter, appreciate it. And hopefully we'll uh, get some good stuff going. Good to see you. I'll talk to you guys. All right. Thanks, guys. Talk to you. Thanks. See you. Bye.